should be live now, but I don't, th I think it's just showing, it's okay, perfect. All right, so that'll be that. You're not on yet, and I only, you can check the stream on your side to make sure that it should just be showing just a starting. Yeah, it's, it's just showing Potion of Knowledge starting soon. Okay, good, perfect. Then we are, we are good to go. And I will get this started here shortly. I'm just double checking everything, make sure that we're not showing anything crazy and that there's no sound being played, which is also good. Okay. There should be music playing though, if you can hear music on your side. Okay. I hear you talking to me. Oh, you hear me? Yeah, but I don't hear music. On the stream? Yeah. Oh, okay. Interesting. <laughs> and I also hear myself. Oh, okay. Well, then let's just uh, do it this way. Oh, everybody, I hope everything is working well because again for everybody who's here my name is roberto gonzalez i am joined here by the one and only mr uh paulo vitor how are you doing good morning sir hey good how are you i'm i'm it's still early for somebody like me uh i'm not used to getting up quite so early unless it's for usually for magic <laughs> like that's about it yeah. like you know like a gp or, or something like that uh yeah i didn't say paulo's can you say your full names because obviously i, I don't <laughs> want to butcher it paulo vitor de Mudahaza. see there you go chat that's very I, easy yeah see i just want to make sure that i don't mess it up so i go with what i would call you i wouldn't use your full name you know under that would be a random circumstance but anyway uh, for everybody who's tuned in the stream, thank you so much. I appreciate that. And uh, we today, the whole idea is to talk to someone who is new to Artifact, but obviously not new to card games. And to give you guys a little bit of insight as to kind of how to get your head around um, the three lanes. Because I think for me... That was the biggest change was going from like one board of magic and worrying about what's in front of me, what creatures are here, things like that to uh, to artifact where you have these three lanes, you have uh, a lot of that going on. And I'm just I wanted to talk to Paulo about it. So, Paulo, can you talk a little bit about just uh what the biggest changes for you kind of when you started? Yeah, I think the, the changes is a very big difference because it's not that obvious that it's a difference. Like when you look at something like, you know, heroes, well, we don't have heroes in magic. So you see something like heroes and you're like, well, I have to evaluate this completely differently. Or this is something completely new. It's the same as when they printed Planeswalkers, right? He changed everything. Uh, with flames, you're like, well, this is familiar. So all the heuristics that you have from magic, you try to apply anyway, and they don't necessarily work. Right. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I think uh, the biggest change from lanes to, to you know, not, not having lanes is how cards and mana economy works in the game. Because mana is individual to each lane, but cards are shared. So this creates a scenario that is very different from magic. For example, in Magicka, curve is a lot more important. Because if I think, you know, oh, you have a two drop versus a three drop. Well, the two drop, you can play on turn two, uh, and the three drop, you can't, obviously. Uh, but also on turn four, you can play two two drops. On turn five, you can play a three drop and a two drop. So that has value on turn. The fact that it costs two as opposed to three has value later in the game as well. Uh, in Artifact, uh, if you have you know, three three drops, you can play all of them in the same turn, one in each lane. So you don't necessarily need to have cheaper cards to be able to play multiple spells in a turn. So when you're playing Magic, if your hand is all five drops, well, you're not going to win because you'll play your first card on turn five, then the next one you have to play on turn six, and the next one on turn seven, and that's too slow. But in Artifact, you have three different lanes. So you have three cards that cost five in your hand, the moment you hit five mana, you can guess all of them in the same turn, and they'll have a big impact. So this is a completely different way of thinking about a mana curve, because it's more in terms of threshold, like how much mana do I need to have this turn to be able to cast this? And then you cast every spell that costs that much mana, as opposed to thinking of total mana of things you're casting. 
So you're not trying to make a composition in a turn of casting a three and a two, for example. You're trying to cast three different fives on turn five and three different sixes on turn six. So that is, I think, the, the biggest first difference that I see. Yeah, and I think for me, I, I ran into that same thing where I would make sure that my decks had a lot of two and three drops because I wanted to be able to think about it like even magic. Like I didn't want to miss my turn three in a lane. Like I wanted to make sure that I was always casting something on three in a lane. And that's not necessarily the case. Like there's going to be a lot of situations where you may not cast anything on, because the first in, in artifact, just by the way, for everybody at home, your first turn, you start with three mana. So with that three mana, in Magic, you're sometimes thinking about what am I going to play on turn one? What am I going to play on turn two? And so on and so forth. And in Artifact, it's it's much different. You, when you start at three, it's nice to have a three drop, but a lot of times your opponent's not going to have a three drop either. So you can, your, your first turn, you might just pass the whole three completely and so will your opponent, and you just move to the next lane. So it is important sometimes to have that three drop so that you can start getting some early pressure. But it, I find that a lot of games go a little bit longer so that you're not stuck thinking that, okay, I missed a three drop, I might lose. Or this lane missed a three and a four drop, I might lose. And there's t times when a lane will not play a three or a four and its first play might be a really big five spell which will get you back in the game because you did already have a hero in that particular lane who might have been dominating and it didn't even need a lot of spell or a lot of help so um on your side though when we talk about that whole idea of card economy and card advantage like how do you think that is different with obviously um heroes coming back well, I think it's different because uh, you are way more limited by, you know, in, in Magic, you draw a card per turn, right? And then you just play the card or you don't. In Artifact, you have to think, well, where am I playing this card? Because if I play this card here, then I won't have access to this card in the other lane. Right. In Magic, it, I think things are a lot more tempo-based because, well, you have five mana, you have this five mana card, this is your window to play. Right, you, you are going to play, you just play that card because next turn you want to cast a six mana card. So if you don't play it now, you're never going to play it. Uh, in artifact, I think it's different because you have three different lanes. So if I don't play it here, I'll be able to play it uh, you know, in the second lane or in the third lane. It's like you're playing three different games with the same cards. So you can't just think, do I want to play this card or not? In Magic, you think, am I playing this card or am I not playing this card? And that's the decision that you make. In Artifact, you think, am I playing this card or am I not playing? And then, where am I playing it? Because you were effectively playing three different games. It's as if you're playing you know, a team tournament, and then there's three different games, and you have uh, a two-mana two-two in your hand, and you're like, well, I can play this in either of the three different games that I'm in. So where will, is it going to make the most impact? Uh, and I think that that part is, is very, very interesting. I think it's the most interesting thing about uh, the game and also for people that don't know the way it works is you can only cast a spell in a color if you have a hero of that color in that lane so if I have a, a red spell I have to cast uh, you know it in a lane that has a red hero and that also changes how you evaluate everything because your heroes might die before you get to cast a spell as well so it's it's pretty complicated it's hard to to say much without <laughs> giving you too much information uh, right now it's not public yet but right. I think one of the most interesting things, for example, is that so the way it works is you have three lanes and either you win one lane really hard or you win two lanes a little bit, right? Yep. Because towers have 40 health and then once you kill a tower, it's replaced by an ancient with 80 health. So you have to either kill one tower and kill one ancient in the same lane. So you do 120 damage to a tower effectively uh, or you kill two towers in two different lanes. So you're dealing 40, uh, 80 total. And a lot of the time, people dominate one lane, and then they fight over the other lane. So for, there, there are scenarios in which you know I dominate the first lane, and then you dominate the second lane, and then whoever wins the third lane will win the game. So I'm going to direct all my efforts towards the third lane, because that's the one where things are going to matter. 
Mm -hmm. So even though I can just play a 2-2 in the land that I'm already winning or that I'm already losing, it's not going to impact the game in the same way that it will if I put it in the lane that, uh, you know, we're competing for. Right. And then you have to think about it. Right. And that's the hardest part to think about, too, is when you get uh, for everybody at home, like I said, some people are still kind of uh, trying to get their head around the actual gameplay. So. Like Paula was saying, you have three different boards, which is essentially three different games, and almost every game comes down to one player dominates one board, one the other player dominates another lane, and then there's this one lane of big conflict. And that big lane of conflict, what you end up having to do is trying to get your hero off of another lane that you already have won and get them into the lane that has the conflict. Because that's how you're going to win, because your heroes are obviously more powerful than some of the, the, actually than pretty much every single creep that's gonna be on the board. And, but the other problem too, is that if you're a magic player, you're used to, if you have the color of mana, or if in Hearthstone, if you just have the mana, you can cast the spell. You don't have to worry about any other real conditions to be able to do that. But in Artifact, every spell is essentially a legendary spell. Uh, so that you not only have to have a hero, but you also have to have a hero of the same color uh, identity. And when I talked to Richard Garfield about it, he said, yes, that's it's almost exactly like in Dominaria, where you have a legendary spell, but there's this extra piece of making sure that it shares color identity. And it's really hard to decide how, to, how much more to commit. You know, it's if I have a lane that I'm winning, I can still win the game just on that one lane. Like if I hit hit them for 40, if I hit that lane for 80 more, I will win the game. So I have to decide, can I actually get this extra 80 damage in before I lose these other two lanes? And there are certain decks that go super wide and can do 40 over two turns. And so you have to, even though you want to go back to that lane of conflict and try to win that third lane because it has less HP, you still have to sometimes go back and defend that lane that might get 80 And Paulo, I don't know if that's happened to you where you've had somebody try to just, you know, go YOLO in one lane and do 80, but do you find yourself doing, trying to go more one lane strategies or doing the more conventional win two towers? Oh, definitely uh, two different ones. I mean, it depends on what sort of deck you're playing. You know, some decks, like, you you just add to your board and then you add more and more and more. And obviously, it's kind of, like, you know, almost quadratic in the way that it, it works with buffs and, and whatnot. And then, yeah, it, it becomes easy to do 80 once you've dealt 40. But you have to really be dominating a lane in that spot. And there are a lot of things that can punish you if you try to do that. I find myself trying to... You know, usually I win one lane and then I move to a different one. So I try to win two lanes. Right. And it's also interesting that, you know, normally a, a card can only affect cards in its lane, right? So we, we've seen some cards already and you compare those two cards like Frostbite, you know, it deals two damage to a unit and then Grazing Shot, it deals two damage to a unit in any lane. Mm -hmm. So uh, the issue that I find is that often I win a lane, but I'm not going to do 80 in that lane. It's just, I, I know from how the game is going that it's not going to be feasible. So I effectively, uh, that lane stops existing for me. So my opponent doesn't have to put any heroes in that lane because that lane's already lost. And there is one or two of my heroes in there that I effectively cannot use. Mm -hmm. Because sure, I have access to five mana. I have uh, a blue hero in there. But what am I going to do? I have nothing to do to damage two in that lane anyway. So it's effectively as if that lane didn't exist for me, even though I already won it. So, yeah, I won one lane, my opponent has to win two of the next two lanes, but I have fewer resources because my heroes are stuck in that lane. But if you have a card like Grazing Shot that deals two damage to any, uh, any target in any lane, uh, so you can actually influence the other lanes in that lane that you've already won. So that is a black card. So uh, it makes a huge difference depending on the composition of your deck, uh, because you want the lane that you win to be dealing with the black hero, for right. example, in, in a spot like this, because the black card can affect the cards in other lanes. So you effectively get to double or triple spell. Uh, but if it's the blue hero in that lane, then you cannot affect the other lanes if you have the card Frostbite as opposed to Grazing Shot. So you have to plan ahead as well uh, with all of this. It's, I think, uh, you know, in Magic, we plan ahead a lot, right? We play, 
you know, at least a full turn loop is what I try to, to tell people. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to play, I'm going to think what's going to happen next turn and then what's going to happen in my next turn. And that is the very minimum that I think you should do. But a lot of the time we plan three, four, five turns ahead. And, you know, in chess, you do this as well, even more than in magic. Uh, and I think in Artifact, it's almost impossible to play four turns ahead because mm -hmm. there's so much happening in a turn that you really don't have any control over. Like, there's just so many things going on because there are three different lanes and there are heroes, there are more cards. Uh, but you do have to plan ahead at least one full turn cycle, I think, which would effectively be, you know, six different lanes, which is six turns in Magic. <laughs> Because, you know, you have to know what's going to happen this turn, right? You, you yep. just do. So that's three different lanes already. That's effectively three turns. And then you also have to know what's going to happen next turn. And that's three more. So I think the very minimum that you do in Artifact is so much higher than the very minimum you'd have to do in Magic because there are three different lanes. Right. And that's the biggest, like, when people say they first learn how to play, they feel overwhelmed. They feel like there's just so much going on and and it really, that's the truth because from the very first turn, you're looking at three mana on your, you know, your left, mid and right lanes and you have, now have five cards. You don't get to draw the first two cards uh, when on the very first turn, but you'll do, you do see in the top left-hand corner, you'll see that you do have a hero coming in. So now you have to decide based on your hand and knowing that you have four mana on all the lanes coming in, where do I need to build, place that hero? Because I know, let's say it's blue and I have blue spells that I need to be able to cast and I need to decide, okay, which lane is this gonna go into? And then how do I prep my lanes now to maximize the ability with this hero coming in. And it becomes even more important later in the game. And this is one of the things that it took me a little while to understand is that even if I dominate a game early, it doesn't mean I'm going to win the game. Like I could be burying my opponent uh, in the early game and they might not even have cast more than one spell. And it's very there's been many games where my opponent can get back in because of some of the global like AOE like that will destroy all creatures, uh, will um, bonus all of his guys, or maybe he has just a big hero that's hard to kill, like he has a big red hero. You know, there's a lot of that. So you have to make sure that late game, if you do have a board clearing spell, kind of like, you know, like Wrath of God in Magic, that you have it, that hero coming in in the right lane and you have initiative. And I think what I want to talk to you about too is, Paulo, how do you explain initiative to somebody who plays Magic? So uh, it's like priority, I guess. Uh, in Magic, you know, you you have priority. Uh, that means you are the person that can play a spell this turn. The difference is that in Magic, if I play a spell, you have a window to respond, right? And in Hearthstone, that I'm sorry, in uh, in Hearthstone, no <laughs> one has initiative because you can just play whatever. Uh, in Artifact. Uh, you don't have a window to respond. So I play something, it happens immediately. So it's as if everything has split second. So imagine, for example, we're in a scenario where uh, I have, well, it wouldn't really work because mana abilities can still be used, but imagine you have a Lenor Elf and a Mountain, mm -hmm. and I have a Lenor Elf and a Mountain, and we both have the card Sudden Shock, which is two damage, split second, right? And... Imagine that mana abilities are still affected by split seconds. So the moment I cast it, it resolves. So in this spot, whoever casts the card first is going to win that fight, right? Because I tap my elf, I tap my mountain, I sudden shock your elf. It's dead. Now you can't tap it for mana, and you can't cast your sudden shock on my elf. So in this spot, because I acted first, that means that I, I got to remove your card before you got to use it, yep. which in magic basically doesn't exist. So in, in, in Artifact, uh, you have to be conscious of who has initiative at all times. And the way it works is that you go, uh, you know, every time you make an action, the next person is going to make the action. So no one plays two actions in a row unless they manage to gain initiative somehow. Mm -hmm. And that, that goes over multiple turns. So we can play a whole turn cycle where, you know, I pass, you pass, I pass, you pass, I pass, you pass. Then the next cycle is going to start with me because you are the last person to pass. Which means that sometimes, you know, if you have a card that is going to destroy their hero in a certain lane, if you can cast that before they can cast any spells, then they don't have a hero of that color anymore. Then they just can't cast the spell. So having initiative is really, really important. 
and you have to give up certain things to get initiative in later lanes or later turns. So I've played games in which, you know, oh, both players have a bunch of cards in hand and they have a bunch of mana, but they don't want to cast anything because if they do cast something, uh, their opponent can just pass and then they'll have to pass again. And so it will be their opponent's initiative in the beginning of the next turn cycle. Right. And that's so a big just, one. Yeah. Because, you know, if you imagine that the first lane is the one you're really fighting over, that's where having the initiative is the most important. And then at that point, you're like, well, this, it doesn't matter what I do here. I just have to make sure I have initiative in this first uh, lane. So you just pass, 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 pass. Yep. And then you, you gain initiative in that other lane. But right. at the same time, like if you're, do, if you're having this strategy, your opponent can just cast all of their spells because they get initiative, uh, then they play something, then you have to pass. Otherwise, if you play something, they can pass. So they know you're passing for everything. So they can just cast like four different things and you're casting zero. So it's a big trade-off. Right, and that's what uh, you, you'll see. Like you'll be, let's say, really behind in the, the first lane or the left lane. You'll be just completely getting buried in this lane and you know that you have to have initiative in the second lane. So let's say your opponent has only one black hero in their mid lane. Well, you need to kill that black hero first because you know that your opponent has cards like coup de grace or something that can kill your hero. So what you're trying to do is make sure that you have initiative into that lane so that you can immediately kill his hero. And now he can't cast any spells in that lane. Remember, you have to also have not only do you have to have a hero in the lane to cast a spell, but the hero has to match the color of the spell that you want to cast. So with initiative, if you can kill that hero before it does anything, now they can't do anything in that lane unless they have an improvement or something of that effect. But most of the time, if you kill a hero before in the beginning of their turn and they have nothing else, no other heroes in that lane, then they're going to be really, really behind in that particular lane. So you'll find yourself passing a lot in a lane just to say, okay, you know what? I don't care what happens here. I'm just going to pass. I hope my opponent doesn't cast three different spells and then put three different pieces of equipment on things and kind of dump their hand. Um, because again, that would actually, that's a thing that happens quite a bit. So you'll see some people who don't want to dominate the first lane because if they dominate first lane, that's exactly what happens. Like their opponents will be able to do all of this stuff because they're trying to, um, get into that second lane. So usually you'll find people who want to dominate, maybe they'll want to dominate first and third, right? So, or they, cause doing it back to back leads to this initiative problem and initiative is super valuable. So that's why you have, uh, these certain cards that will do something and then get you initiative. That's they're su super important. Uh, because at the end of, let's say if you're in that first lane and like Paula was saying, you cast all these different spells and things like that, and your opponent wants to pass. If at the very end of that chain, you cast a spell that gives you initiative, your opponent is like is super behind. Because now you can do what they were trying to do, which was kill the hero. Now they can't cast any spells, and now they can dominate that next lane. Um, but, Paulo, I guess the other question I have is, for somebody who plays really high-level Pro Tour Magic, how would you compare a normal game of artifact to a high level game of magic, like when it comes to planning and obviously you're still in the beginner stage of artifact. So, you know, there's a lot to learn, but how do you feel when it comes to like the pressure of planning and things like that versus high level magic? Yeah, well, uh, full disclosure, I haven't played that much. I have about 30 hours in uh, with artifact and I know there are people who have like 500. 500, yeah. <laughs> So it's like, well, I just got into beta, but you know, I, I've played a, a decent amount and I think I understand uh, a, a decent amount. I think you have to do more planning in Artifact than you do in Magic because uh, every decision is uh, amplified because you can do it in three different games as opposed to one. So again, in Magic, like it's turn three, I have a three mana card. I'm gonna play, right? That's basically not a decision because I, I give this scenario to 100 players and probably 100 will make the same play and yep. they'll pass the turn with the exact same board state, right? And this in Artifact is not going to happen very often because there are so many things you can do. Like I can cast it in any of the three lanes, for example. So you probably already have a split 
Like some people are going to cast it in one lane, some people are going to cast it in the other, some people are just not going to cast it yep. because there is not a real big downside to not casting it because mm -hmm. you can just cast it next turn because you will have three mana available in some lane. You know, it's very rare that you use your mana in all the lanes. Some people will have placed a different hero in that lane, so they won't even be able to cast it. And then you have the spells that affect any lane. So, for example, if I have uh, you know, a black spell that affects any lane, and I have a black hero in all three lanes, that's already like uh, you know a, a way more different combinations than you can have in Magic, because I can cast it in any of my three lanes, affecting any of your three lanes. And then I'm going to spend the mana on that lane and affect another, or spend the mana on that lane and affect that same lane. So I think the permutations that you have in Artifact are so much bigger because every small decision is a big decision. There are no small decisions. Right, yeah. Because like you were saying, like if I have three black heroes and one is in each lane and I have a three drop that's black, now I have to decide which lane am I going to pressure. I have to look at my opponent's heroes. I have to decide, okay, which hero can I pressure the most with what I have in this particular lane? But then you also have to think, okay, what cards are available to my opponent that can counteract this? And which of my heroes is most vulnerable? And which of his heroes can take advantage of it the most? So that is really what is the hardest equation to kind of solve early game is because you have this initial turn placement which i call itp and initial turn placement is like the the big rng that people talk about and it's also probably the most frustrating rng because in the very beginning of the game uh it places one hero in each lane and but it's random which lane it's in and on top of that your creeps will come in and they'll also place randomly so if you're having if your heroes are let's say low health and they're placed randomly in front of a big hero that can kill it it's hard because now you have to plan a whole different game on okay i'm going to immediately lose my luna let's say in lane my mid lane okay if i lose that am i going to in a turn from now am i going to replace her into that lane am i going to replace her into a different lane uh now that they have a gold advantage and i have a gold disparity of let's say now five what does that mean for my boards? Is he going to try to advance that mid board because he killed the Luna? Is he going to try to do something else? And that's there's that's a, all that you have to comprehend quickly because the timer is against you. Because if you lose, if, you, if all your time runs out on any board, you lose the game. Like, so if you tank too hard in one lane, you will lose the entire match that way. So you have to also evaluate uh, your time bank and making sure that you do have enough time so that, you know, those early turns you want to kind of blow through if you can, so that you can start banking more time on your harder turns, like your turn six and seven, because I think overall, I haven't lost too many games and I haven't won too many games on turn five. Like it's, it's really hard uh, unless early game, like I've had games where I've just buried my opponent in the very beginning. I've killed all three of their heroes on turn one. And yes, when you do that, it's easy to maybe win a game on turn five, but Turns six, seven, and eight are really the game-winning turns, mostly. Um, but there's also this thing about gold disparity. And, Paulo, talk a little bit about what extra that gold thought process ha adds to the game. Yeah, so with gold, is th the way it works is you build your deck, and then you build your item deck, uh, and you put cards that you can buy in the shop. And there are also some cards that the shop will present to you, regardless of what is in your item deck. Uh, and then every time you kill a creep, you get one gold. And every time you kill a hero, you get five gold. And then there are cards that give you gold as well. And then every turn, when the, the whole turn, the whole three lanes thing ends, you go to a, a shopping phase where you can buy items from the shop. And those items uh, usually make your heroes better. Uh, you know, there are equipment or consumables that you can use on your heroes. And uh they really compound an advantage because you know oh i managed to kill your hero in the first round so i gained five gold you have zero gold you can't spend anything uh then i can use this five gold to make my hero even better which means i'm really going to kill the next hero that you place in this lane so they i think gold is the kind of snowball advantage mm -hmm. but i think in general i greatly overestimated how important it was to have good placement in in the first round Yep. I think you actually tweeted about this, and, and I agree. Uh, or you, you've talked about it in Discord, yep. I, don't, I don't recall. But 
because it used to be that, well, my hero is facing an opposing hero and my hero is going to die. And, well, wow, that was so unlucky, I lose the game on the spot. And that just is not the case, because the early game is so much less important than the late game. I think the late game decides artifacts game almost all the time. Like, I don't believe that I've ever won on turn 5 or even turn 6. And I've never lost on those turns either. Because towers have so much life and you have to kill so many towers. And I think a lot of it is the fact that, you know, that what we talked about in the very beginning of the stream, that you aren't constrained by your total mana as much as you are by, you know, how much mana you have access to in a given turn. So again, in Magic, you have three seven drops in your hand. Like, well, I can only play one on turn seven. Then I can play one on turn eight and one on turn nine. In Artifact, if you have three seven drops in your hand, that means the moment you hit seven mana, <laughs> you cast all three. Yep. One in each lane. So the comeback potential is incredible. And I think uh, it's actually important, you know, so when you kill a hero, it goes to the fountain and it stays a turn in the fountain and you can redeploy the, the following turn. And it's not that bad to have your heroes die at the right moment because that guarantees you have a hero in the turn that you want it. What's really bad is that multiple heroes die in the same turn, and then you end up in a turn with no heroes or a few heroes. So, for example, we have a card like uh, you know Zeus that's already being uh, previewed. The, its signature card is Thunder God's Wrath that is deal four fusion damage to each enemy hero in all lands. So if you can set up a scenario where your opponent's heroes are all under four health, mm -hmm. then you cast Thunder God's Wrath, you kill all of them, and your opponent will have no heroes for two turns then you just win the game. But if your opponent's heroes, some of them died last turn, for example, now you play Thunder God's Wrath, but next turn, they can already redeploy the heroes that died the turn before. So in this space, uh, it's in your best interest to not kill their heroes, to just get them to four health, and then to kill them all at once. So it's very counterintuitive. Like, you can even heal your opponent's heroes right. or do something like that. It's very counterintuitive that sometimes you want your heroes to die. And sometimes you don't want your opponent's heroes to die. So it's really not necessarily about, um, you know, it's not necessarily about the early game. I think it's a lot more about the late game for this game, at least so far. Right. Well, and like I also. Maybe there are decks that <laughs> I haven't seen. Right. Well, and the other thing, too, is that sometimes it's good that your hero dies early. Like, you do sacrifice gold if they die. Uh, on turn one and that's okay you'll have you know you'll be behind in gold but if your opponent say has like an axe in a lane well if he has axe in a lane and you have a hero that isn't going to battle well against him you'd rather your hero die on the spot and that way now it's not trapped on that lane for another turn and now you can push a lane and you can just decide to give up that lane right like you can just hope to say okay listen maybe my opponent will be uh, just he'll stay in this lane. His and his, if his best hero is stuck in a lane by itself, you're totally fine with that because now if that's basically like in Magic, like if his Mythic Rare is stuck somewhere and doesn't he doesn't ever get to play it, you're you're totally okay. And now he's got to figure out how is he going to get his best card off of that lane and into another lane and then you then you have the ability to counterattack. like you can plan for your opponent to say okay well i'm gonna try to move it off this lane and maybe he has one or he hasn't really deployed much into that lane and then you can redeploy into that lane now because he hasn't really committed much to it except for that one powerful hero but one powerful hero will still take a long time to knock a 40 tower down like that is it's not like just one hero is going to be able to do it. Like it's hard to get to 10 power on, like on the first turn because a lot of the equipment only may add uh, plus two or things like that. And it's still going to take multiple turns and a melee creep like can't randomly spawn in front of it. Right. So it's not like heroes come with trample. So sometimes you'll see someone try to dominate one lane with maybe one or like a hero in a unit, like a melee creep, but then two creeps might spawn in front of him. And now he just got fogged on that lane. So now you're able to press the advantage in the other lanes. And again, that goes back into that future planning. It's okay. I know it sucked that my, uh, my hero died on turn one, but now I'm not stuck for three turns fighting against a hero that I can't beat. And now it gives me time. And like Paulo said, when you talk about Thunder God's Wrath and on seven, 
you know, whenever every hero comes with three copies of his signature card. So if you have Zeus in your deck, you're getting three copies of Thunder God's Wrath. And I have definitely had a game where I thought I was going to completely win the game. There was no chance my opponent could come back. I had all of my heroes on the board and he only had Zeus coming in. Oh, no, sorry. He had two heroes coming in. So he placed Zeus in first lane. He placed another blue hero in his second lane. And then he just cast Thunder God's Wrath, killed my guys in the first lane. I... And then in the next lane, cast Thunder, Rod, Thunder God's Wrath again. And now all of the heroes on all of my boards just ended up taking eight piercing damage, which pretty much kills all your heroes. And it's, you want to talk about a feel bad? <laughs> Losing all of your heroes in one turn, you just like, you, you just like kind of like look at the, the board and you look at the, your, uh, your screen and just kind of like, oh my God, like now I just have to not die for a turn because you're going to get all five back, but... You you just gave your opponent twenty gold, you know, in the mid game, which means now they can almost buy anything that they want to buy, like apotheosis blade or something crazy like that. Um, but again, that's kind of that whole future planning thing. Is you know your opponent has that, so sometimes you're just planning. Like in Magic, you do plan for like the worst case scenario, but usually the worst case scenario isn't like your opponent spending twenty one mana on turn seven, like or your opponent spending fourteen mana on turn seven, like. That's like Tron numbers, you know, where you're just like, oh my God, my opponent can cast like 15 drops or a seven drop here and now a seven drop there. And that happens quite a bit in those big turns. Like your opponent will cast a removal spell on one lane, a really big creep in another lane, another removal spell. And a lot of decks are built that way. Um, but I haven't figured this out yet. So I'll ask you, Paulo, on your um, your limited hours that you've played. Have What does an aggro deck look like an artifact? You know, it's really hard because I think so far I've had so much more success with those lower decks than the aggro decks. Uh, but I think an aggro deck would be one that tries to get an insurmountable advantage early on. And, you know, I don't think you will get to the point where you kill people before they cast their seven drops. I think that's realistically not going to matter. Right. But you could get... Uh, into a spot where even if they do cast the seven drops, they're so far behind that you win mm -hmm. right and that would it will probably be a deck that relies on getting initiative very often because you know oh you have the you know you, you have the better heroes uh, essentially and then you want to make sure that your opponent's better spells don't uh end up winning in the late game so you have to make sure that when you get the late game you get to cure your opponent's heroes before they can cast you know that third god's wrath and I think uh, an interesting parallel of what you talked about in Magic that I was thinking about is imagine that you have a Sarah Angel, right? Sarah Angel is a 4-4 Flyer. Vigilance is a really good card. Your opponents play a Lyra or a Baneslayer. That's an even better card. So it's completely outclassing your Sarah Angel. And it feels awful that your Sarah Angel has to attack into a Lyra, right? It's effectively not doing anything. Obviously, in Magic, you don't have to attack. In Artifact, you do have to attack. Uh, and it will feel awful. But then you consider the fact that, well, your Star Angel is going to die, but in two turns, you can put it in any other lane. So, yeah, your opponent is going to have a Lyra in the third lane, and, you know, that Lyra is going to win that lane. But it's not going to have any impact in the other two lanes, and maybe, and your Star Angel will. So maybe the Star Angel is enough to win lane one or win lane two, at which point it's doing the same thing as Lyra, even though Lyra is a much more powerful card. So it's what you said, it's trapped in that third lane. Right. But yeah, I don't really know what an aggro deck would look like uh, exactly. I have not played, you know, enough to to have formed a real meta game in my head. Right. But I imagine an aggro deck would would rely on having powerful heroes. That's what I think when you say an aggro deck. Right. Like my heroes will kill your heroes in combat early and often, and then I'll have to find a way to beat your spells. Right, and that's what I think. Because I was when they told us at PAX that the blue black deck was the aggro deck. You know, yes, there's decks that can go wide and then maybe pump all of their guys uh, to do a lot of damage. But it never felt like that was like, it felt more like a combo deck than it felt like an aggro deck. Like it, it didn't feel like that deck was like attacking all the time. It felt like it was just like, it built to like one crucial turn where it just kind of went off. And aggro decks, in my opinion, are usually like you said, like if you have a black hero that has, you know, really high power and really low toughness, that feels more like an aggro card because it can kill a hero in one shot. 
and then you can add equipment to it so that it has a bigger toughness so that and that's what that snowball comes in it says like okay in the beginning of the game my seven power creature kills your seven toughness creature and my guy stays alive with that gold i use that to pump the health of my black hero so now it will kill it and it'll kill another hero without dying and then you start building that advantage and then maybe you heal your hero or something like that and every turn that a hero's on the board and it doesn't die and it starts and it just generates all of this gold it's just going to get better and you're not locked into the equipment that's on your hero so if you put let's say a short sword on something that's a you know gives it plus 2 attack and then you get like a plus 8 later on you can just replace it with the plus eight, you know, granted you lose the gold that you put on it originally, but usually that hero has already generated that gold back anyway with that improvement. So it's not that big of a deal. Um, somebody in the chat asked about the discussion about, let's say buffing and nerfing cards. And obviously we can't do that in magic, but it, on my side, I, I've played quite a bit. I haven't really seen any cards that are just like stupid broken. Right. But Paulo on your side, how do you feel about the idea with, because this is going to be a TCG like magic where you buy booster packs, you do that kind of stuff. How do you feel about the idea of buffing or nerfing a card where you actually buy individual cards? Uh, I mean, it's pretty tough. The way other games do it is that, you know, they give you a refund, so to speak. I don't know how you would be able to do that. Uh, in this game, I, I really like that in those digital games, you can nerf or buff cards. Like, I think it's a real issue with Magic that you cannot do that. Uh, so I would hope there is a way to do that with Artifact 2 that doesn't make the players feel bad. Uh, right, because I, I, if there's trading, is there going to be trading? Yeah, uh, maybe. It's, yeah, it's even, even harder, you know. Oh, so I trade for my card and then suddenly this card is great. Well, now I wish I hadn't traded. So I don't know how that is going to work exactly, but I think the ability to change a format without making people feel awful is one of the great things about the digital card games that cannot be emulated in Magic. Like in Magic, if they have to ban a card, you know, it's it's the apocalypse. Right, it's dead. Like they've been doing it, yeah. And you know, what what can you do about it? Like sometimes people buy an entire deck to to play around that card. Now the card's banned. Now the whole deck is useless. It's really bad to ban a card, and you can never buff a card. Right. So I think uh, you know you see like the meta game in other games like Hearthstone, like you know even like League of Legends, Dota. Uh, you can buff a hero, and then you change the entire meta game without having to release anything new. Like you just tweak a small number in one ability of one hero, and you change the meta game. And so the meta game always stays fresh, even though you don't have to necessarily be releasing new product. In Magic, for the meta game to stay fresh. You have to release something, or you have to bend something, or take something away from rotation. And I hope that Artifact has a way of making the Matic game fresh uh, without necessarily having to do those things. But I don't know how that's going to work. Yeah, and I think a lot of people uh, who are going to be playing Artifact are not Magic players who have gotten used to bans and like the threat of something being so good that it could get banned. And and obviously that plays a big effect into the economy, right? Like if you are currently a Tron player in modern, so for people who don't play magic, it's just a, a kind of like a popular combo deck, but it's, it wins, right? And it's, and it's good. But the thing about it is that you have this constant worry that a piece of your deck may get banned. And if a piece of your deck gets banned, it may not be that your whole deck doesn't work anymore, but it doesn't work as well. And then if your deck doesn't work as well, all of the value of the cards in your deck suddenly kind of not plummet. But if you're, one of your key cards is banned, like let's say you decided, uh, and again, I'll be using magic terms, but there's been combo decks in magic where like one, there's a planeswalker that can copy a creature. Well, if it copies this creature, it can make a million copies of the creature. And they found out that that was just too powerful. So what they did is they banned the actual creature itself. Well, the, Part of that is that you didn't really care so much about the creature because it was common. So you didn't really lose any value there. But if you had the Planeswalker, you know, it might be, you know, let's say it was 15 bucks and now it has nothing to work with. So now it's five or maybe it's a dollar or whatever. But Magic players are kind of used to that. They're used to the idea of things getting banned. And I don't think that a lot of people who come from Hearthstone, like if you come from Hearthstone 
and you have to pay for individual cards, and then all of a sudden, let's say somebody, like, let's say Axe, well, not even Axe, that's a bad example, because that guy's great, but, like, let's say <laughs> um, Zeus, who is normally, like, a 3-7, right? So, the thing about Zeus being a 3-7 is that if an aggro uh, hero drops in front of him, it'll kill it, like, because there's seven power guys that are out there that can kill it instantly. Well, if I buffed his toughness to, let's say, 9, all of a sudden... Zeus is very, very good. His value could spike overnight uh, because now I don't have to worry so much about my ITP because now in the beginning of the game, he may not die as often, right? Like now it's going to require a seven power hero in front of him and a creep that hit the 25% to, sorry, I keep saying toughness, but I'm just, that's a magic player <laughs> thing. In, until I play, you know, 500 hours of uh, artifact, I will probably call There'll be some mixture of like Dota terminology and magic terminology because that's just what I'm used to. But anyway, so like I said, it's these buffs are going to happen and the market is just going, I think is going to get used to it. Like you're going to have, like you said, if, if there's even just a small toughness or a small power increase on a hero, heroes, if, especially if it's a rare hero. Right, like if it's a rare hero that all of a sudden gets a little bit of a buff, that could have real ripples in the market. But I think that's kind of cool too because I like. Well, the thing that sucks about Magic sometimes is a format gets solved really fast. Right, like it's like, oh man, this is the best deck. These are the best sixty, and that's it. And you should be if you're not playing this deck, you either need to be playing something against it or you're making a mistake. And that's just kind of how it goes. And artifact one obviously having the best deck is going to be important but it's also i don't you can guess like you can talk to this how hard is it to play perfectly in artifact versus to or excuse me playing perfectly is impossible i think but how hard is it to find the correct line of play in artifact versus getting the correct line of play in magic i think it it seems to be harder in artifact uh for now because in, in magic i think you have more force plays like it's what we talked about before like yeah, you have a two-drop two mana, you're going to play it, and everyone would. So it's very hard to mess up in that spot. Like, the, the messing up is just not playing it. Uh, and, and in Artifact, you can, you can... Everything that you do, you can be messing up. So I think... You know, people say, oh, no one plays perfectly in Magic. Uh, you know, I think that is kind of true, but also not true. Like, it depends on the game. I think there are a lot of games in which you... You can't play perfectly because if you get, you know, 10 pro players and give them the same game, they'll play the exact same way, all 10 of them. And, you know, I think that's just playing that game perfectly. Maybe you lost anyway. Right. But, like, you didn't have that many decisions, like that many key decisions. And in Magic, sometimes, you know, oh, there's one very important decision that is going to define the game. And then, yeah, that's where it will defer. That's where the worst player will make a mistake. But still, like, the good players will make that decision right. And we'll get to the same outcome. And then those players play that game perfectly. Um, and I don't think an artifact that's going to be a reality. I think if I give 10 you know, future artifact pro players the exact same cards, then no one will play the exact same game. Yeah. So I think it has to be harder to play artifact perfectly than it is to play magic perfectly. Yeah, and I think that's... Even though... Oh, go ahead. Yeah. No, even though playing magic perfectly obviously doesn't happen nearly as often as... Some people think, you know, we still make there are like there are mistakes in magic that you cannot make in artifacts, such as how you behave, you know, because magic is a, a real game. It's a real person game. Right. So maybe you gave, you know, you gave away information by how long you took to think. Right. Right. And that then, well, you're not playing perfectly because you gave away information you didn't need to give. And an artifact that's not necessarily going to happen. Like you're not going to you know, shrug or blink or whatever, but that is a very small part of magic, I think. Yeah, and I think too, in in Artifact, one of the other um, kind of interesting things is bluffing, because in magic, we we can, it's I don't say it's easier to bluff, but it is, like, I if I pass priority to you in my first main phase of magic, I still have the opportunity to cast spells after combat. So, like, I can maybe appear that I don't have something to do where I actually do, right? And in Artifact, bluffing is much more risky. It feels a lot kind of like going all in in poker because like if I, like if I have to do something in a lane, right? 
sometimes it sucks to be the first person to act because if I'm the first person to act and I modify one of my heroes and then my opponent kills it, now I have a problem, right? Because I spent mana or I spent gold or I did something and it was immediately counteracted. So sometimes I will pass knowing that I still have something to do and I just pray to God that my opponent does something, right? Because the worst thing that can happen is maybe if I pass and he passes, now I haven't done anything, right? It's like a check raise. It's like, okay, check, go. I see what happens. And then sometimes your opponent makes a mistake and they do do something, right? But that something maybe isn't good enough and now I've gotten initiative. And that's another thing that is important is how to capture initiative without spending cards. Um, but I have found myself, and I don't know, Paulo, if you have, where you're trying to keep initiative, but you're trying to make it not apparent, right? Like, how do you think, what are some of the other things that you've seen little quirks in the game that maybe are not in Magic? Well, I think mostly you want to play, it, it's a real, really interesting balance between playing your powerful, expensive uh, stuff early or playing your cheap stuff early because heroes have abilities that you can use that cost no mana and the items cost no mana. So in theory, you think, well, I should play the card that costs no mana first right? because that means I have all my mana left to react to whatever my opponent does. So if I have seven mana up, I play a card that costs zero, then they'll do something and then I can just you know, use my seven mana however I want as opposed to, well, I use my seven mana for a card, then you play something, now I don't have the mana to react. But at the same time, the more expensive a card is, the more powerful it is. Mm -hmm. And then you run the risk of your hero just dying. So if I have a Thunder God's Wrath in my hand, I'm like, well, I'm not going to cast that yet. I want to keep my seven mana up. I'm going to cast this item that costs zero. Then they kill your Zeus. You're like, well, no, I can't cast my blue spell. Right. Right. So this this balance is really interesting. And I think, yeah, th there is a bluffing in Artifact too. And it's not necessarily bluffing uh, the way that you think, you know, in poker, right? Wow, I thought they had something, but they really tricked me or whatever. It's more different evaluations. For example, uh, we are in a spot where, say, you have the card, I don't know, no accident. They just do three damage to something. And I think, well, if my opponent had no accident, they would have played it here. Mm -hmm. And they didn't. They passed priority to me. So I can play this card. And then you go, you play your edit, and they go, no accident. You go, God damn it. Yeah. You know? And that is, a, a, you know, they took a risk. Uh, they have the chance that you, you know, you're not going to do anything. Then you just pass the turn. But now they think it's worth casting the no accident. So it's it's really tricky. I think you have to you have to understand the game to know when your opponent is going to do something. If you want to do something like that, it's a different kind of bluffing. Right. Then you know, oh, attacking, I might have giant growth. I might not. You don't know. But it's still like a mind game, even if it's not a bluff. I like to get the term mind game more than bluff. Okay. Because I think sometimes it's not even wrong. Like when you bluff someone. The, the you know normal understanding is that it's a zero-sum game, right? right. I, I'm telling a lie, you're believing it, so I'm right, you're wrong. And I think that isn't necessarily the case in Magic or in other games even. Sometimes it's right for me to lie, and it's also right for you to believe me. Mm -hmm. And finding those spots, is that's when you have to lie. When it's right for them to believe you, it's when you have to lie. Right. And that's how you gain advantage in mind games. Right. And then the other thing too is, and I just learned this recently, is there's also a strategy to uh, in your decks to having just all cheap equipment. And the reason why is cheap equipment will, I mean, it does something to your hero, right? So like, that's fine. But the other thing about cheap equipment is that it acts as a card that says, you know, pay X gold, gain initiative sometimes. Because you can do that to be able to you, you just don't want to use your mana early. like And that's what I'm finding a lot of is like, let's say I'm on turn seven. Well, I don't want to spend my seven mana first because if I do, I don't get a chance to respond to my opponent on what they do. So you'll have a lot of turns. Like, let's say you'll be in the first lane and I might, if I have initiative, I might just say, okay, um, I'm going to, instead of just passing doing nothing, I might just play a cheap piece of equipment. Now I play that piece of equipment I pass to my opponent. If my opponent doesn't have a cheap piece of an equipment to play, he now either has to pass completely and then risk me passing too, and then we just move to the next lane and he doesn't get to use any of his mana, or he has to now play his spell 
And I get to now, I don't want to say respond because I don't actually get to respond, but I do get to react to whatever that does. So if he has a card that, let's say, he has seven mana and now he gives uh, one of his guys damage immunity. Okay, well now I know that he can't do anything to respond to whatever I'm going to cast. So now I can either, A, I can put a big, let's say a huge creep on the board or a huge, you know, I don't know what, the, I think it's, I think it would be called a, a creep, but anyway, I put a huge, you know, creep on the board or a huge minion on the board. And now I know he can't kill it because he can't respond. Um, or now I know that I have to use coup de grace on his damage immunity guy instead of maybe something else because I just need to get it off the board. So there is this strat to being able to use the cheap equipment to force my opponent to use their mana. And if they use their mana first, Again, that gives me an advantage because now I have more information. And I find that Artifact is a lot of just who has the most information. Like, who knows the most about what's possible moving forward. And when you get to those... And this is what Paulo talked about earlier, is uh, you have to be able to plan for multiple turns. And not only just the three boards you have in front of you, but then also... What's happening the next turn? Which heroes are coming in next turn? So if I I don't might not want to use this spell that's a removal spell in my hand because I know for a fact that my opponent has two heroes coming in and he's going to want to try to gain back the advantage he may have lost in mid lane. So now I say, okay, I have this coup de grace in my hand, but I'm not going to use it on lane one right now. I'm going to hold it for next turn so that I can use it in mid so that I can immediately take out this blue hero that's coming in who might be able to cast a board wiping spell. So that is, you know, kind of um, the future planning. And I know that's kind of complicated for people who don't play artifact. And I apologize because I know that not everybody's in the beta. I know that that's why you're here because you want a beta key and we will give a beta key out. Uh, so what we're going to do is I'm going to let Paulo go here in probably the next five or 10 minutes so he can go about his day. And then we do have footage to talk uh, and, you know, do more of that. And obviously, Paula, hopefully I'd like to have you on next time and then be able to be able to screen share with you so that you can talk about some of the games. Um, but I'm not that technologically advanced and I didn't know how to set it up in today. So, uh, but that'll be for another thing. Uh, so yes, most people have not been able to play Artifact. So I don't want to go to inside baseball on you. Uh, but I do want to give you uh, the opinions of some people who've played Magic, like on the Pro Tour. Obviously, Paul has played way more than me, but to kind of describe that. So anyway, the last thing I want to talk to you, Paulo, about is Magic players. We're going to talk directly to Magic players. So obviously, if you don't play Magic, this might not apply to you. But for Magic players who are thinking about playing Artifact, what kind of advice would you give them? And then what kind of things could, since they're not able to play today, what kind of things would you suggest that they do to help prep them for when Artifact does come out? And yes, he is frozen oh, right my now. My camera's frozen. You're frozen, but uh, we can hear I, you. I promise I'm moving. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think, you know, the big thing that you should do uh, at this point in time is probably honestly just listen to you know, stuff like this. And I think everyone is so excited to make content about Artifact. Like you see, you know, there's the Discord, everyone's talking about it. Oh, when is the NDA gonna be lifted and, and whatnot, that the moment that the thing is out, there will be such a waterfall of content, uh, you know, falling over you that you'll be able to catch up very quickly. And I think this is probably what you have to do Right. You, you, obviously, right now, you should familiarize yourself with the terms and how the actual rules work. But you don't have all the cards. You don't have all the context. We don't know what organized play is even going to look like, for right. example. Yeah. Like, there's this $1 million tournament. Is it an invite-only tournament that none of us will ever play? Or is it going to be a qualifying thing that anyone can get to? You know, we don't know anything about that. But I do know that the moment the game becomes available... There will be a lot of articles. You know, oh, I'm yeah. going to write an article about uh, artifact for Magic players. Uh, there is going to be, you know, a lot of streamers, a lot of videos. Uh, people really want to make content for artifact, and right now they can't. So the moment that it becomes available, you can jump right in. Yeah, and I'm and Paulo is not exaggerating even one bit. Like the people who are in the closed beta right now are, I mean, biting at the bit to be able to create content. And I mean, most of us, whenever the NDA gets lifted, I, I don't know when that's gonna be, but it's like when they give us 
the time to say, okay, this month, this day is when it's going to start. People are going to be up at like, you know, two o'clock in the morning or midnight of that day or whatever, starting to work on their videos, starting to work on their articles and starting to getting them published all over the place. So I think the difference for new players versus people like us is that we don't have that, that like, uh, uh, I guess the knowledge, the, the opportunity to be able to like maybe read up on like a article that talks about how to play, how to deal with initial troop placement, how to deal with uh, initiative, how to deal with gold disparities. Like all of those things are going to be available to you like day one, like hour one. And that is going to really help you on that curve. You're going to have uh, strategies like for limited where like Paulo and I might have articles coming out where it just ranks every single card and every single color and you'll have a basic idea of what are the best heroes that I should be like if I was if there was like draft or like let's say sealed or something like that you'll have an idea of what are the best cards and in constructed it'll be the same way it'll be like oh these are the decks that won because they might be able to publish some of these like internal tournaments that had happened previously like and there you go you know like that seems really really strong because Right now, everybody in beta is kind of just developing their own strategy. They're developing their own theories. And that's why I wanted to have Paulo on today because what Paulo thinks today, I can guarantee you will be much different, you know, when he's like 100 hours in, right? Because you'll just learn more. It's kind of like we're all starting over and we're using our magic terminology and our magic uh, history to frame artifact cards uh, as opposed to using our artifact experience to frame artifact cards. And I think that's going to make a big difference. Like I've learned a lot just even over the last, you know, 48 hours just about card rankings. And that's from talking to other players. And so that's what we're going to be able to bring to the table. So Paulo, thank you so much, you know, for coming in, but can you tell everybody just how to reach you on like, you know, your Twitter and that kind of stuff? Yeah, you can reach me at Twitter, you know, it's at PVDDR. That is probably the best way to reach me. I also write magic articles every week for Chain of Fireball and Daily MTG. So you can reach me there. And we have a podcast. It's called Pro Points, but this is all about magic. That's okay. Uh, if you want to talk to me about some, you know, artifact so far, Twitter is probably the best way. And yeah, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, before I go. Yeah. Uh, you know, someone's like, wow, people are going to have 500 hours of advantage over us if they're in the beta. Like, how are we going to compete in this $1 million tournament? And I think, yeah, it is a bit of an unfair advantage in a way, but I think, I don't think it's insurmountable. And I think, you know, there's a lot of diminishing returns in this. So I have 40 hours now, right? And there are people that have 500. I don't feel like I'll need 500 no. to catch up to them. And, you know, the thing is going to release in October and the tournament is going to be next year. So, yeah, there's not going to be difference between someone who has, you know, a thousand hours or 2,000 hours, the difference is not that big. So as long as you can get your hours, uh, then I think you'll be fine. It's not like, you know, it, it will scale linearly. I don't think that's how it works. So I wouldn't worry too much about that. I think there's still time for people to practice. And honestly, I would much rather have a background of 10,000 hours in Magic yep. and have half as many artifact hours than someone who just has artifact hours. Yeah. So because I think you know a lot of the, the mindset is similar, even though the games aren't exactly the same. So I don't feel like I'm at a big disadvantage by having only 40 hours as opposed to 500. I am, I am at a disadvantage, but I feel like I'll be able to catch up. And I think everyone will be able to catch up, uh, even people who aren't in the beta and will not get in the beta before the thing actually goes public. Right. And I think that that is probably the truest statement I've heard in a long time is, I would have, ra I'd rather have played Magic for my last 25 years than, uh, than have 500 hours in Artifact. Because the thing is, is that you can have 500, you can have a thousand hours of Artifact and that can't replace like the high pressure environments that you've played other tournaments in. Like it just can't, there's just nothing that can replace like, let's say playing on the Pro Tour or playing, you know, a, a match for top eight or something like that, where it's just a high pressure. You have to think quickly and it's easy to make mistakes and it can be, you know, life or death for that particular game. Like that is, those are invaluable experiences. And I find that even in the beta, people who have 
like I said, 500 hours. They still lose to people like Paulo and I. Like, they still lose to us. Like, that's not like they come in and they just automatically just, like, stomp us down uh, every time we play. Now, and that's because we're learning more about what cards are available. Because early on, you know, you just don't know the cards. So you can't play around cards you don't know. And it's like when a new set releases in Magic, like if one person knows every single card and has them all memorized, they're going to have an advantage over somebody who doesn't. And, but the curve, the learning curve is very, uh, I think it's, you learn a lot fast. And somebody who's put in 500 hours already, I don't know that those same people are, when it launches, that they're going to put in 500 more. <laughs> like that's going to be hard. And also a lot of those 500 hours the game is different. Like the cards might've been different. Like they might have changed who knows what, you know, in the metagame and there's not constant tournaments. So like if you're somebody who played on like in MTGO and you're a grinder in MTGO and you play eight hours a day of tournament games, that's a lot different than somebody who may play casually for a thousand hours or for months. Like that doesn't, they could get more out of a week of play than they'll get in a year of play. So I don't, I know a lot of people on, uh, discord and like on reddit they're like oh man all these pros are going to come in with all these hours they're just going to win the tournament and i will you know if i was a betting person which i am um i would <laughs> i would definitely say that it's not going to be somebody like one it's not going to be i don't feel it'll be one of the people who has the top 10 percent in time played will win the big tournament because the magic players now that i know are coming in and they're putting teams together. They're working on trying to solve the formats. And we are good at that. We're good at getting together as a team and breaking something. Especially, this will be the biggest prize we've ever seen. You know, we're Magic's never had a million dollar first prize. So you can guarantee that the guys are getting together and girls, you know, to put these teams together and break the format. So that's something that you should see. And uh, thank you, Joe the Super Cow, for the Twitch Prime subscription. But Paula, what else you got? Anything else you want to say before you go? Oh, that's pretty much it. Okay. Yeah, I think what you said is right. And, you know, honestly, not just Magic. There's Hearthstone people, too. Uh, yeah. There's Cross Legends people, too. And everyone will be, you know, flocking to this $1 million yep. <laughs> prize pool. So, yeah, I think I think it should be very interesting. Uh, you'll see, again, you'll see a lot of content. So, you will progress much faster than people in the beta. Like, I, I've played 40 hours. I don't know a lot of the rules. Like, right. I, I still. routinely ask on Discord, like, how does this work? And you will know all that when, when the game comes out. So I think, yeah, if you were worried about, oh, other people have a lag up, yeah, they will, but it's not that big, so go for it anyway. Right, yeah, come come through and uh, try your luck, right? Test your might uh, against uh, everybody who's coming through. But all right, Paula, well, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, hopefully, I know that you have, uh, for Magic, you have, like, an academy, right? that you do like tutoring and things like that. Is that correct? You still do that? Yeah, we do. Yeah, well, there is, I do magic coaching, but also there is Spikes Academy, which is an online platform with lessons. So it's like pre-recorded lessons that you can watch however you want. And it's like a real school, so to speak. There are like tasks that will test to see if you actually learn what the lesson is trying to teach you. Uh, yeah, that is a thing that we've been doing in, in magic. Okay, well, I just want to let everybody know that that, He's doing that on the magic side and I have definitely, and I, I tell everybody now I've been like stealing your idea about that on magic <laughs> to do that for artifact, because one of the things that people have a hard time doing is like when they first start playing, like, how do I play? <laughs> because there's not like an official like tutorial. And when I talk and this for this, I don't know if they've, people have told this on Reddit or not, but like I talked to the devs and they said that they don't even want to develop a tutorial because nobody plays it anyway. Right. So like, they, I don't know that's going to happen, but anyway, Paula, thank you oh, so I much. I missed the tutorial. <laughs> I didn't I say, I wish I would have got the tutorial too, but like I lost a lot instead. Like I just got beat down for many, many games. So thank you, Paula, for, I appreciate that. And uh, we're going to move into uh, some actual, right. oh, what am I doing? Here we go. Some actual gameplay. All right. Well, thanks for having me. Of course. Anytime. And yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye, Chad. So Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's, All right, see you. Let's make sure that we turn him off on Skype because I don't know if I have. <laughs> uh, but what we're going to do... Oh, I don't want to cancel my stream. Let's not do that. Um, yeah, you see Th Th Thanos' hand. Uh, all right, so let me talk to you a little bit about what we're going to do for this uh, the giveaway. Uh, so 
we are going to, let me find uh, my beta key here. I've got, uh, I do have this uh, wonderful golden ticket here that I want to make sure that I do give away at some point today. So I didn't explain how it's gonna work. So here's how it goes. Um, we are gonna modify somebody with this beta key, but you, a couple things. One, you do have to be a follower uh, on my Twitch. Uh, so obviously that's very simple to, to do that. Um, and then what we're going to do is it's, we're going to, uh, go through one game and talk a lot about, uh, just kind of what's going on and answer some questions and things like that. And as soon as uh, we finish with this one game, we will do a, uh, the giveaway. So you don't have to do anything special except you need to be a follower and you need to be in the chat. So that's literally it. Um, again, if you did like the interview, uh, thank you so much. We, you could always use your Twitch Prime subscription and become a, uh, a, sub a subscriber on my channel. So let's, um, it's pretty easy. Uh, what I want to do is get started on uh, our game here and kind of talk a little bit about what we're doing. So in this game, um, this is one of the, it, it looks like I think this is one of the games where it's a um, retweet. No, I, oh, sorry, you're correct. Um, we do want to make sure that on my uh, my Twitter, it is at Rob AJG, and there is a, uh, a tweet that talks about the giveaway. So you do need to retweet the tweet, sorry. I, whoever, uh, Danique, thank you for reminding me. Um, but this is a game against a bot, it looks like. Um, this looks like the red-blue deck versus uh, the black-blue deck. And the reason that there's a big finger in this is at PAX, what would happen is after you waited in line for five or six hours, um, you would see, um, I'm going to do the raffle on screen because last time um, I didn't do it on screen and people were like thinking I tried to rig it or something. But um, in this game, so you wait in line, you would sit down and then somebody from Valve uh, would actually teach you how to play. Um, and so that's what's going on here. Uh, so let's kind of go on. We'll tell you where you were at here. It looks like we've already, yes, the previous guy did claim their key. Um, we've already passed through turn one here. Um, and it looks like now we are in our, we're in first lane. We took some damage to turn one. And, but it looks like this person uh, actually lost their hero in this lane. So because they lost their hero in this lane, they're not gonna, it doesn't look like they're gonna be able to cast anything here. Um, but let's kind of uh, just kind of get into the gameplay. Um, and again, you know, if you don't wanna sit around for the stream, that's fine. I'm, I'm not gonna be offended. You know, if you just wanna get a key and come back, that's whatever. You know, I wanna try to make sure that the people who want to actually talk about artifact and see artifact games, that they are the ones that are here. Like, so, you know, Go about your day if you want to come back later. So um, anyway, so he's looking at his cards and yeah, the purple hand is in. Uh, so right now, they're trying to decide really what he wants to do here. Um, we're looking at dimensional portal. Obviously that brings in three creeps. And the reason that, so we're looking at, we're in lane two, but the reason that it had showed lane one is he wanted, to, he was thinking about maybe casting grazing shot back into lane one. But right now, he want, he's thinking about just going really wide on these with the melee creeps in this lane. And the thing about that is he, he's got a 2-3 here. And that 2-3 is actually going to... It's not going to end up dying. So that's why he's not really in a, a real hurry to use his grazing shot on this 2-2 over here. Um, but here, let me find the uh, tweet for you. So that way, you guys will just have it. And that we don't have to have you search around the internet for it um give me two seconds and i'll share it with you and here we go do, 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 do. and here we go um all right here you go so um, 
his opponents already uses four mana, so he doesn't have to worry about anything. He doesn't have to worry that uh, a creep is going to get redirected into his black hero. Because uh, that would be the worst thing uh, that's going to happen, is that he loses his 8-2 somehow. Uh, but we want to make sure... He's got to get Luna off the board. Um, you have sound? Something with sound not working? Um, so... There's no sound on the games themselves because like there's all kinds of random like stuff going on at PAX and it just sounded terrible. So I just kind of took it out. So now he's got these melee creeps and he was hoping um, to be able to redirect this two points of damage that were... Cause, so there's a 50... When there's a hero to your right and there's nothing to the, uh, to the in front of you or to the left, uh, you have a 50% chance of going forward and a 25% chance of going to one of the other directions. So in this case, he was trying to get a little bit lucky and have that melee creep do two damage to Luna and get Luna off the board. Because if he gets Luna off the board now, the next turn she's not going to earn her Eclipse um, charge. And that's the big thing about dealing with Luna is trying to make sure that when you they do cast Eclipse, it's not for some astronomical number. Uh, so that's what was trying to be done here because that was really all that could be done. I guess he could have also um, done a Grazing Shot, which might have been a little bit better there. Uh, but I don't see a problem in trying to just maybe spam this lane and protect because if he does end up getting Eclipse he'll have uh, all of these melee creeps that might be able to absorb some of those Eclipse charges. So right now, he's going to kill a melee creep. Tower's going to take 16. So he should be pretty far ahead here. Um, and his opponent does have, uh, looks like Earthshaker coming in next round. So again, in this lane, um, is Eclipse charges go to zero after one use? No, like Eclipse charges just stay. So like, Every turn that Luna's out, it just gets another charge. So, like, your first Eclipse might be for, like, six, and then it'll go up to seven, and so on and so forth. Eclipse gets really stupid early. Um, but this is what we talked about is with Paulo, is that sometimes early game you lose heroes because they end up getting put in front of really, uh, really big other heroes that just die. Uh, so that's it looks like that's what happened here early, and now he's just trying to not get killed. Uh, but... It, to his advantage, he ended up getting two melee creeps put in front of these two people in lane three so that the actual tower is not going to be taking any damage. So he gets to pass, pass, and now he's going to have two heroes coming in. So before we shop, we want to kind of talk about where we want to place here. So in lane one, he's got Zeus and Bristleback, right? So, but there's three melee heroes here. He has to kind of, melee, excuse me, melee creeps in lane one. So he has to decide... Right now, we're going to be going to five mana. When a hero dies, as a revive later in the match? Yes, if a hero dies, it just goes back to the fountain, and then it's gone for one turn, and then it comes back. Um, I would say normally that lane one, you're not... Even though there's a bunch of, of melee creeps here, there's not much to do in this lane to try to get back. Because you're playing blue-black. You can't... It's going to be very, very hard to kill Bristleback. Like, Bristleback is... if. Any of almost any of your heroes gets put in front of a bristleback, it's going to die. And he also has Zeus there, which is going to end up doing uh, whenever he casts a blue spell, he'll end up doing uh, piercing damage. So I don't think that one lane one is an actual option. Uh, in lane two, we we can do something here uh, because, but we do have this eight two. Um, but I think that if we go lane three we do have a better ability to uh, get ahead here. Um, the problem being is that if we abandon lane one, now he's, when your opponent wins the first lane, it, you know, it puts a lot of pressure on you because if they try to go 80 in that lane, they can 80 the lane and then win the match before you win the two other lanes. So you just have, decks are not limited to two color combinations, uh, but at PAX, they gave you these pre-constructed decks that were all two colors. So you can play, you know, five heroes in a deck. And if there were five colors, which there's not, there's only four, you can, uh, you could play, you know, a hero of every color uh, if you wanted to um, or, or monocolored. But I think the option here would be to try to push uh, lane three and we could also try to maybe conflagrate um, back into our mid lane to really make sure that we get that one and we get that Luna off the board. So, uh, but let's see shopping phase. Uh, it looks like uh, our gold for 
the blue black deck got a little bit cut off on the video but he has at least three so i would almost certainly make sure that we buy a short sword here uh as opposed to a healing solve um because one we want to get through our item deck um but i would guarantee so horn of the alpha obviously um player's time like in hearthstone what happens here is that you start with a bank of like five minutes per board and then at the end of every turn you're going to get an extra two minutes to your board so um so right now he's getting two more melee creeps into lane two which is going to help us continue to push that advantage but the problem is that because there's so much in that lane this Earthshaker, we have to try to keep a blue hero off of this this mid because if he cast Echo Slam, it's going to kill everything in this lane and we're going to go from a dominant position to just like getting stomped in the lane. So even it's at tw it's at 14, so hopefully we can just win the lane this turn and then it won't matter if he places a blue hero later and Echo Slams us because it, we, won't, we don't want to be on that lane anyway. Um, so those two extra melee creeps are going to go really hard. And I think what he's going to do is he will probably just, since he has one melee creep coming in, he probably will place this, um, this earth shaker into the, into lane two. Um, so I would probably at, so that I make sure I can cast a black spell there. I could cast, um, my black hero or cast. I could place my black hero in the mid, um, I'm definitely not placing the maiden in lane two. Like, um, but I guess there's also that the, the reason that you might place maiden in lane two is because it's a two five. And if I put it into any of the other lanes, it's possible that it gets put in front of a hero that's just going to kill it instantly. Um, but I think I have ventriloquy in uh, within the blue black hand. So I think I would just go ahead and place um, both my heroes into lane three here uh, and see what happens. So I think... Yes, Paulo was on earlier, so you did miss Paulo. So let's see what what he's thinking here. Uh, in chat, I don't know what your strategy would be here, but again, I, I we're definitely not going to put both heroes in mid. <laughs> That's the one thing we're not going to do. Uh, there's also a strat that he could say that he could just go ahead and place both heroes in the top, but I don't I don't think that's correct because I just don't I don't want to be in that lane. See, he decided. Okay, and. This is where I think that this wasn't quite right is he decided to put two into top or two into the first lane against two heroes. So he knows that that Earthshaker is not going to go into uh, the third. Well, it could go into third lane, but I don't think it's going to go into third lane. Um, it probably will be going into the second lane. So if he places those two heroes into the third lane, he has a better chance of being able to make sure that... Um, we can win that lane, but I would rather go against the six, six than go against what we have in the first lane. Cause all those heroes are going to die. Um, you are not limited to the number of minions or characters on board. So like you could have 50 people in one lane. You could also have a million uh, cards uh, in your hand. And if you did miss Paulo's interview, I am going to post it on YouTube. So don't worry. You haven't, you know, right. That's the other thing is that if you do place main or in lane one, you don't have to worry this turn about getting put in front of Bristleback, but you could end up, he could redirect Bristleback into your your guy and then have to deal with it that way. So I just don't know that I would want to necessarily have to go against um, two different, or to go against two, I know there's two heroes in there for a fact. And I would rather go into, maybe into the third lane. So anyway, it will not break. I have had like 60 minions uh in one board okay so he ended up placing it in th lane three the earth shaker because he wants to try to win i guess he thinks he's going to win one and three um so now we have a disciple of and an untested grunt um the question here now becomes is like how do we win this board because we didn't get put in front of bristleback bristleback which is good he hasn't done anything just quite yet um, we could, we want to make sure that we use all, as much of our mana as we can. Um, so, but we don't want to lose one of our heroes. I don't think that on this turn he has with five mana, he has anything that can kill one of our heroes immediately. So we don't lose any value here by just placing a short sword on, uh, the maiden to kill that melee creep and then see what he does from there. So I think that's 
probably what we're going to see here. Conflagration is not it. All right, so the reason that um, that card died is because our opponent cast uh, the draw two cards, and then that one damage went to the melee creep and killed it. So uh, did you say he's strafing run? No, no, no. You definitely, with one mana now, you just do uh, the short sword and, and go from there. Like, I don't think that there's any other reason to do that. And the YouTube channel is youtube.com slash Rob AJG. Um, does it have a higher skill cap? I would say so. Um, I've played a lot of hours of Hearthstone, and this game is... Um, there's a lot of planning that goes into it, and if you uh, when you mess up, it, you get punished quickly. So I don't like casting Conflagration here. I don't think that... It, I mean, so he wants to put Conflagration in this lane so that he can... Um, kill the Luna, uh, and then whatever else pops out. But he could easily have just done that by because he has a black hero in lane one. He could have just cast Grazing Shot on Luna, and it would have just killed it anyway. So, yeah, that Conflagration, we could have done that in this lane. We could have cast Conflagration and cast it back into our first lane. So now all he can do here is he can put the sh he can still put the Short Sword on, um, but I'm not sure that that's, um, I would have done it the other way around and just cast Grazing Shot and then use my extra mana to uh, put in a untested Grunt and put some damage onto Zeus here. So, but, I mean, it. so the thing about Zeus being in that lane is every blue hero can cast Thunder God's Wrath and every blue hero can cast Eclipse. So you just want to get make sure that whatever board you have that is really weak to uh, Eclipse, you just don't want a blue hero on that lane. Like So you want to make sure in this case that you knock uh, Luna off this lane so that way you can kill the tower now. And then if they do cast uh, Echo Slam or Eclipse or whatever, it won't affect this lane. And then also on top of that, you want to make it so that your opponent doesn't want to put anything else in this lane so that you can cast, uh, or you can use Disciple of Nevermore. Um, and if you do Disciple in this lane, then we could probably try to 80 this lane after this turn. So like, if it was me, I would almost certainly in this lane right now, I would um, put the untested, uh, no, I don't think I put untested Grunt this turn. Well, maybe you put untested Grunt this turn just to have it um, because your opponent, it, you, he has that Luna dying, and if he wants to place it back in, then we're going to have to make him do that. So, But right now, we're going to kill this tower, and now, once we kill it, we just want to get get our heroes off of this lane somehow. So even if he comes back in and destroys everything, um, not having assault... Like, if he can get assault ladders in that lane, obviously that'll be strong. But, you know, right now, he's going to have to deal with this Red Mist Pillager, um, and having RMP in this lane is going to really suck. Um, because now he he has to kill RMP. Uh, if he doesn't kill it, it will just snowball and it will destroy this entire lane. So he has to end up putting a blue hero in this particular lane so that he can strafing run and uh, end up killing all the RMPs. So like the good thing is that this turn, it'll come in, it'll do four, it'll make another one. And then next turn, he since he has a blue hero coming in, he can place the blue hero into this lane and then immediately cast uh, strafing run and you know and kill the rmp in this lane so like that's fine um it's it's not ideal um because if he does place a blue hero into it you just have to hope that it doesn't get put in front of um but it you know in front of the six power yes pillager rmp is red mist pillager yes it'll be a very nice strafing run um anytime strafing run can get you more than one gold we're totally fine with that so um Again, it'll take us down minus 12. Uh, we'll be at 18. Uh, phase booths, okay, that's whatever. I don't really care about that, but he wants... So, like, I'm not sure... Like, so the reason that he cast phase... He wanted to put the phase booths out is he's going to not have initiative going into the next lane anyway. So if you're going to not have initiative, you might as well just get rid of cards that you're going to use anyway now um, and do it that way. So that's what he said. He figures, you know, he's going to lose initiative. Let's just use the card now and get that toughness higher because he knows that the longer a blue, the bigger toughness a blue hero is, the more likely it's going to be around to um, 
turn seven to be able to cast Thunder God's Wrath and obviously turn six to cast Eclipse. So, um, yep. So now we're at 18. He's getting another one and he's going to need to do something on that side. All right. So we have nine, uh, nine gold. Um, with this nine gold, we, I would suggest that we definitely get first get the short sword uh, so that we can dig through our item deck and see what the next one is. And that's one of the things that I didn't really know at first is how, how do I use my gold? Um, but we want cheap stuff unless the equipment is completely broken. So short sword first, see what's under it, and then just kind of dig through there and see what we can do. Um, cause our strategy right now is to put that disciple and, or the untested grunt and disciple into our mid and try to do 80 to that lane. That's what I would suggest. But again, I don't know, uh, what this particular, uh, player is going to do, but he also has to defend, uh, defend one. Cause if he doesn't defend his first lane, he could just end up losing one and three and then just losing the game. So he's got to figure out how he wants to do this. So that blue hero is probably going to go to, uh, he has to, I mean, if he, if he places the blue hero, see, here's the, here's the issue he runs into. He's got Jamoy coming in, right? So if he puts Jamoy into one, then you, if you buy your whole item deck, there's just nothing left. You just can't buy anything from the item deck. You can only buy from the secret stash and then buy consumables. So, um, if, if he puts it into lane one to try to defend, defend lane one, he, commits three heroes to that first lane and then just tries to win mid. If he puts it into lane, yes, it's um, fixed at nine. I think you can put more in. Um, but if he puts it into lane three, then he runs the risk of Jamoy getting put in front of a red hero. And that's a problem, right? But then he can cast Strafing Run to kill the RMPs in that lane. And then he doesn't have to worry about that lane getting 80 and he can just sacrifice the lane. Um, and then hopefully he actually wants his blue hero to die. So then he can replace it back into lane one. But the issue there becomes now is lane one. He still, we're, it's got, it's at 19 health and it's currently taking 11. And that's just right now. We don't know what else is going to come out of that. So we, uh, there's a concern about this particular uh, situation. So we need to try to find a way to get a blue hero into lane three, but also defend lane one. So, all right. So here's the good thing is that he did end up getting two creeps in to that third lane. So we know that those two creeps are going to place in front of the two heroes. So we could place, um, if we don't place anything, if we don't place Jamoy into there, it'll, those two melee creeps will place in front of the two heroes. Um, if we do place Jamoy in there, the very worst thing that could happen is um, it'll get placed in front of uh, the red hero in, in lane three, but it won't die instantly unless he modifies it. So, um, so you could get a random apotheosis. Yes, you could get a random apotheosis blade out of the secret shop. Yeah, that is that is a real thing. So, chat. I'm not sure where you would put it, but I think based on what I see here, um, I'm more concerned about losing. Um, I'm more concerned about losing lane one than I am about losing lane three right now, because if one of my blue heroes dies, I don't think he can get to 80 quick enough in lane three. Like, I think I'll be able to place a blue hero back into lane three and then be able to strafing run and kill all the RMPs. So let's see what he does. Yeah, go, you say go left and then try to win from there. Yeah, I think we're just trying to live to 80, right? We, if we can 80, we, yeah, that's the problem. It's like, we, you can let it run free for a couple turns because right now with those two melee creeps coming in, um, it's possible that it gets placed in front of one and we don't have to like terribly worry about it. All right, we have double battlefield control, which is, goes really hard. We have to worry about this three damage on our, our maiden so we can cast a blue spell. So there's a... Um, I think one of the things that we would I would probably first do with Maiden is I would put a Traveler's Cloak on it to give it the extra health. So that way um, he can't like instantly kill our guy uh, with a spell. Um, this Grazing Shot he could use on... So actually those two melee creeps perfectly put got put in front of both the RMPs. I don't think he needed to do that right there. 
um, you don't have a max hand size. And yes, I am in the beta already. So he cast Eclipse and then we just died, right? So like that was the issue here on six is that we wanted to make sure that we could keep our hero alive through an Eclipse. And had he just cast um, the armor on the blue hero, it would have lived and then he could have actually cast some spells in this lane. But instead he just... Now lane one is just lost. There's nothing he can do here. Uh, so now we have to really go hard into this lane. But the problem now is, since he has Luna coming back, if we try to Disciple right now, we're not going to do 80, right? So we do 47, and then now he can place Luna into this. Um, I'm about, uh, I think, 80-some 80, 80 hours in. I don't, I, somewhere, somewhere in that neighborhood. Um, so he can 53 this lane, but he can't do the the rest of the damage because he's the per whoever the opponent is is going to just place Luna into this lane and then either if he eclipses it'll kill everything if he strafing runs it'll kill everything if he casts um echo slam it'll kill everything so that's not a thing oh wow and another eclipse here yeah um okay so now we have to ch he has no mana um I don't, there's no reason to do that first, but okay, whatever. Um, you can, so you switch it around. That doesn't make a difference either. Um, so I'm thinking, so if he, uh, does Cleric work in a closed beta environment? Like work how, I guess is the best, better question. Uh, he can strafing run here if he wants to try to kill that red pissed mi RMP. I always say red pissed, but it's it is a pissed millager. <laughs> That's what I always call it. Uh, but RMP, it's going to die anyway. He can't do anything to save it, so it doesn't actually matter. Um, but he could um, strafing run to just use the mana here and kill it, and then get the extra two if he's going to try to win this lane. Um, That's going to be the problem here. He he's going to have to. If he does that and puts it on here, so now it's at eight, and then he can Traveler's Cloak on it to keep it alive and save six damage. Don't click OK. Oh my God. <laughs> uh, yeah, opponent. That that that's just the exact opposite of what he wanted to do there. Oh my God, that's terrible. Um, if he would have put the cloak on his hero, it would have lived, and then he could have Strafing Run on top of that, and so now. You can guarantee that this Luna is going to go uh, mid and he has Echo Slam or like Strafing Run or something like that because this game does not look very good for him because he's going to lose the first lane, which is fine. We, we pretty much gave up on that lane anyway. But now I don't know what the plan is to try to win this game. Like he has three heroes coming in, so he needs to just live to be able to do that, but he has no heroes and he just got Thunder God Wrath. So yeah, like this, this game could have been halfway decent had uh, our opponent or had our opponent had the blue black player played like anywhere close to correct. Um, but no, he was like, all you have to do is live. And he failed miserably at, at, at life. Uh, because he has no heroes anywhere. I, and this has got to be Echo Slam, right? Like, I mean, it doesn't actually matter because it's only 26 damage. It doesn't even have to use Echo Slam. Um, was there any way with initiative to kill the hero in mid? Um, n if we had a Coup de Grasse and a black hero in this lane, we could have um, Coup de Grasse on Luna first, but instead he just got taxed. <laughs> tower barraged and destroyed every single hero in yeah there was so many that's why you, you can't you really don't play um the hero that you know i mean the hero the, the minion that takes away armor and buffs your attack you don't do that early you usually don't do that when you're gonna win and instead he just got blown up for three mana he just got wrathed <laughs> like and this is one of those things where i was kind of talk to you about his future planning and this person just didn't do any of it. They, like, it's hard. In this game, it is so hard to lose all three lanes. Like, and I mean really hard to lose all three lanes. And somehow um, this player 
figured out a way to lose three lanes because now the problem is Earthshaker has his ability available. So even if you put all three heroes in lane three, he's just going to stun every single one of them. So you're going to need to place your heroes into this lane. You're going to need to um, have initiative and then somehow deal six to the Earthshaker before it activates an ability. So I, I don't know uh, what how that's going to work at all. <laughs> like he's got steam cannon. So like he could, he could put a black hero in a different lane. So that way he can steam cannon, uh, into something, but getting all of your guys stunned is going to be a big problem. And now there's a poaching knife. So he's got to find some way to not take three damage in this lane next turn. And, I don't know how that's how that's going to work. Um, I guess it's possible he could try to do 27 in mid, but there's really no way uh, for him to do that. He only has two gold, so there's nothing nothing on that side. All right, so let's talk. He got a melee creep into lane three. He also got one into lane two, but we have to protect lane three in order to not lose. And right now it's taking 13. So at the very worst... Um, if we, play, if we place nothing into lane three, it would still take 13 because the melee creep um, could get put in front of uh, the 2-4. Uh, we can't win mid right now because there's no way for us. We have to make sure that lane three doesn't take three damage. So we have to pray to baby Jesus that he doesn't get something with siege, but he has 20 gold available. So he only needed to get uh, like... A, a mall or something like that to give it siege and then we just can't win uh you can draw like if let's say for example you know one player won lane one and then you won lane three and then you both kill your towers in lane two it would be a draw so at this point all he can do is place yeah siege is gg um if he places all in lane three even if he gets everybody stunned, they're not all going to die in one turn. Um, but he could get Berserkers called, and that will be GG too. So, but I think the only thing that he can do is just place all three into uh, all lane three and and see what happens. You can't allocate resources to all three lanes. Like You have to pick which two you're going to win or which one you're going to win, and that's, that's it. Like... He could, okay, so the other thing he could do here, um, so let me let me back this up real fast. So if if he places the black hero, oh, uh, isn't Axe, Axe is not in the blue-red deck. Okay, um, so if he places the black hero into mid, he could use the seven mana to, because uh, he has initiative. So he could put the black hero in mid, use the seven mana to put the steam cannon into mid, and then shoot the steam cannon into lane three so that he can guarantee that he uses, uh, he gets a use out of his steam cannon. Because if he places all three into lane three and then immediately gets um, stunned, then he won't be able to cast the steam cannon. So I think that's probably probably what we should do. All right, so he just placed all three in there. And then again, the problem is now he can't use all of his mana. He only has eight mana and he wants Steam Cannon. He wants Dimensional Portal. Um, and, you know, he wants like all of this stuff. So it's also possible that he could have just put the Black Hero in lane one. And since he has initiative, he could Steam Cannon over into lane three and then hope that his opponent does anything in lane one or lane two. So he gets initiative back. And then when he gets to lane three, he can Dimensional Portal and then block... Um, all the damage coming through. In addition, he could cast Dimensional Portal and Untested Grunt into lane three. Uh, so that's what actually probably should have done. Just put the Black Hero into lane one, um, Steam Cannon into lane Steam Cannon into lane three, um, and and do it that way. I think that would have probably been quite a bit better. So now he's gonna just lose. Yeah. Because now they're all going to get stunned and and he's just dead. So he's going to pass. There's Thunder God's Wrath. 
grazing shot. Again, if he would have placed the black hero here, he could have like a steam cannoned. Oh, well, here's Thunder God's Wrath. Um, he could have steam cannoned here and cast grazing shot. And steam cannon plus grazing shot um, would have been close, right? So, well, cannon, like the problem here is that if he has another Thunder God's Wrath here, it's, I mean, that would be the third one, right? Um, that would be really, really bad. So he has to pass here. He can't do anything. Um, I just want to see in his third lane, had he, oh yeah, yeah. So he just messed up really bad. So if he would have cast, watch. So if we look on this third lane again, had he put the steam cannon into lane one and then shot the earth shaker, then he could have grazing shot and killed it all from lane one. And then there would be no blue hero on lane three. And he would have actually probably had a chance here because see, it's already has six toughness, right? So then it would have taken four from steam cannon. It would have taken two from the grazing shot. It would be dead. He can't, at that point, he's not able to stun everyone. And then we only have to deal with the 910. And we have battlefield control. Uh, so we could have battlefield control the 910 over to the melee creep. And yes, I'm in the beta, by the way. Um, and you are limited to three copies of each card. Um, we could have battlefield controlled over. We could have double strafing run in this lane and dimensional portal in this lane. And that would have, and drew a card off of Jamoy. All of those would have been, I mean, granted there is this conflagration in the, um, which would kill our, uh, our maiden, but we only need to have one blue hero in the lane to, to live. And he would have only had um, the red card and we could have put a traveler's cloak onto our Jamoy first to keep it alive and then be able to just cast everything that we want to and get two heroes next turn but he didn't do that so he is uh in deep deep doo-doo because he can't he cannot get rid of earthshaker now and thunder god's wrath isn't going to do it even if he would have cast the steam cannon in the first lane and then cast thunder god's wrath in this lane he would have been able to uh kill the hero but being able to steam cannon and then grazing shot from lane one and then this place being able to strafing run twice, battlefield control, and then dimensional portal would have been sick. Um, how's beta? Do you have all the cards or need to invest? Um, I don't believe that we're just going to be, we're not, they're not going to give us all the cards once um, we're out of beta. We're going to have to buy cards like normal folks. We just get to test all of the, the bugs and, uh, and play a lot. So. All right, so he has initiative. The first thing he wants to do here is he doesn't want to put travel. Okay, it, he doesn't. There's no world where he wants to put Traveler's Cloak on this guy because if he does, he doesn't get to cast any of his blue spells. So, at the very minimum, he needs to cast Steam Cannon or Thunder God's Wrath or Dimensional Portal. Uh, the S is silent and Coup de Grace. No, I, everyone has told me that it's not definitely not Coup de Grace. It is definitely Coup de Grace. So, but. Um, yeah, I think, um, how often would you say that you end up in a situation where both players run out of cards? I have never seen it happen. I've never seen one player run out of cards. Not, not once. Um, yes, whoever I'm watching is not the greatest player. That is an understatement because now he's just going to get everybody stunned, won't be able to cast any spells and then just lose. So, yep. Yeah. Um, if you want to see how much mana he has to spend, it's the eight over eight in the middle. Um, and I'm, like I said, hours played, I think I'm pushing about a hundred. I don't know. It's somewhere, somewhere in that neighborhood. Um, he cast time of triumph first instead of stunning us for whatever reason. Um, I, I don't know why. Well, again, both of these players are new. Um, and so maybe that's why he cast time of triumph first. Um, but yes, he definitely should have just stunned everybody first. Um, 
So now we still can't do much. We could put a steam cannon in, uh, but that's not going to do anything because now everything has plus four siege. So I mean, we can't beat time of triumph anyway. Um, so we would have probably, we would have been dead anyway, I think. Um, <laughs> you, you think the bot is actually a top player? Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Just bot on uh, super hard. All right. So yeah, 17 damage. This is going to be instant death. Um, untested grunt is not going to do it. She's like, tell <laughs> whoever is teaching them how to play is like, yeah, put the untested grunt in front of this minor, you know, minor detail. You, uh, everything has plus four siege. So uh, that's not going <laughs> to make any difference. And then he's like, she'll be like, play dimensional portal. See what happens. Nope. Oh, earth shook. So yeah, that's like, that was it. Like that could have done, just done that first and just not slow rolled them. Um, he's like, the person's like, I'm going to cast battlefield control. No, you can't. Everybody's stunned. Get out of here with that. Get out of here with that madness, that madness. But again, this is one of those things about uh, artifact where, you really need to make sure you future plan. You really need to make sure that you have a better idea of what your opponent's cards do. Um, and in this case, our opponent made that a, a really bad error of in lane in the middle in the mid lane of putting the uh, the disciple in early so that it just everything got murdered when uh, Luna came back. Um, yeah, because like, I'm pretty sure that this is the end of the game. Because if you look, one of the other things is if you see this little blue the coin turns blue. That means if they push it, they win the game. And on the same token, like if on their, on your side, if it, uh, if it shows blue, it means that if you push it, you win the game. Um, there are misplays in the mid game of artifact are way punishing. And I mean like astronomically punishing because you, uh, you just, can just instantly lose the game like and it it sucks because in artifact you you never feel like like sometimes in magic you get mana screwed you get um you know mana flooded and you feel like you just never got to play uh and in artifact you always seem like you're in the game you always seem like there's a chance for you to win and that you like made like maybe one or two errors. So like when you lose a game of artifact because you made a, an error, not like a planning error, but like just like you played the wrong card, you just, you don't ever feel like you want to rage at your opponent. You feel like you just want to rage at yourself. And that, yeah, that's that's the hurtful part uh, about, you know, investing so much. So let's, uh, we don't want to replay this game. So let's um, let's quit out of that. All right, so let's uh, let's get uh get let's modify somebody with uh a key but i'm gonna make sure that this time we uh we show you who we pick because that seems like i don't want to hear i don't want to hear no madness i don't want to hear no madness from nobody about it uh so what we're gonna do is we're gonna we're gonna open a uh a new raffle that's what we're gonna do we're gonna do a little bit of that so uh it is uh 8 54 so we have six minutes so in the chat if you type exclamation point raffle that should be able to enter you into the raffle so you have until 9 a.m to type dot or i mean exclamation point raffle into the chat R-A-F-F-L-E. And that should be able to... Oh, it's blocked. <laughs> Hold on. Let me unblock. Let me unblock that for you real, real fast. Um, so we'll give... We're going to basically give it about... Once I unblock it, um, we'll give it about 10 minutes uh, for people to, to get in there. Um, but let me unblock it really fast so that you can actually type it into uh, the chat. Uh, do, 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 do. Sorry, guys. I am uh, looking into. All right, hold on. 
where to unblock it. I am new to all of this, so you will have to excuse me uh, on that. On uh, Okay, we could probably do five. Yeah, it's probably better. All right, here we go. Um, moderation. We will delete that, and then we will save. Okay. Try again. All right, perfect. So now five minutes till 9 a.m. my time um, to type in dot, or excuse me, exclamation point raffle to get put into it. Um, it still blocked you? I just saved it. Nope, it's still not working. All right, hold up, hold up, wait a minute. Um, let's reload it, make sure. Oh, maybe I'd have to reset it. Um, all right, so let's do it this way. Let's do it this way. Um, I will do it off of our chat raffle. Let's see if that works. Okay, nope. And I'm just trying to figure out how to, uh, let's see. Hey, hey, there you go, it's working now. So at 9 a.m., I will uh, I will pick someone, and then that person will also have to have retweeted the uh, the Twitter, the Twitter retweets, and uh, if they hadn't, um, by the time I had done that, uh, then that will be a problem, and we will just give away two the next time. So. All right. So again, the whole thing here is I think Artifact is, I mean, I, I like Artifact a lot. And I mean, I, that's not a secret. Um, and it's just hard. It's just, it's really, really hard. Um, and it's really easy to make, um, make mistakes. Um, how will I confirm that the Twitter account and Twitch accounts uh, match? It's a good question. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. I haven't thought about it that far. Again, this is one of those new things on trying to figure out how to balance like a giveaway and make sure that it's fair. Um, so yeah, basically, yeah. Whoever wins, I will... Uh, I will private message them and look at who's retweeted already. And if they give me a Twitter name that's not in there, then uh, that won't work. Uh, here's the tweet, by the way. I will confirm through DMs, don't worry. And then there's the tweet, in case you're wondering. Got two minutes, two minutes. I am going to do my best to make this as fair as I possibly can, because I know that if I wasn't in the beta, I would want a chance and I would want it to be as fair and as crystal clear as I can. So that's what I'm gonna try to do. And then uh, I will just keep pasting the link to what you need to be doing on the, the retweet. Um, so like I said, we've got about one minute before it closes, so, um, all right, well, what we can do is on the next uh, stream, so here's the other thing I was thinking about doing is just streaming every day in the morning for like two hours, from like seven to nine my time. And then for the next, you know, I don't know, let's say 10 days or a week or whatever, we would just alternate um, how we would uh, give away the key. So like maybe one day we do Twitter, maybe another day we do Twitch or whatever. So. Um, but yeah, you still have probably about 30 seconds, uh, to get in on this raffle right now. And we are going to see what's going on. Remember, you also have to be a follower, um, on Twitch, which shouldn't be terribly difficult. Uh, all right. I have closed the raffle. So again, everybody who is, uh, in it before nine is going to be part of this and you do have to be a follower on 
Um, if you have a different follower name, don't worry about that because I'm going to message you anyway. So um, <laughs> I like how there's 240 viewers here with 50,000 raffle messages. Exactly. Like, I don't know how, how that's possible. Um, but all right. So I have my, uh, my draw button ready. And again, I'm just going to give you fair warning. If you are not a follower, um, before I draw your name, we will give two out. Let's just do a, maybe we could do a stream tomorrow morning. Um, but yes, here, here we go. Let's draw. All right. <laughs> what did it cost is the, the winner. Um, so what did it cost has won the raffle and uh hopefully it says two days ago yeah joined twitch two days ago so i mean i guess it i have no idea that sucks i understand um so if you have my my twitter is rob ajg um if you have a better way to avoid people who have not join twitch in the last two days like a bot account um let me know i did see that what did it cost sent me a message um but yeah if you have a better idea on how we can uh do that maybe it needs to be twitch for a certain amount of days um and that could be something that we do i just want to make it so that like actual like one person who doesn't have like 15 different accounts that they made um did it so like maybe for so I didn't announce it before this, so maybe on the next one, we will make it so that you had to have joined Twitch at least, what's a fair number? Like a month? Two weeks? Like, um, yeah, he did respond, so he is in there, um, but minimum month. Okay, here's what we'll do. Um, <laughs> five months a month is fair i think a month is pretty fair because then they can't at least like create like an account that day so what we'll do is we'll stream tomorrow i will give um i have here's here's what we'll do here's what we'll do because i'm going to make this fair this one is going to go to uh the person who has this join their twitch two days ago okay that sucks but okay that's what we're going to do they're going to get there what did it cost you got it um Tomorrow, I will, so tomorrow is Saturday. Um, we will do an early morning um, stream, okay? And I will give away two. How about that? And then that way, you have to, the person will have to have been, um, a, 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 a twi have been on Twitch at least a month, okay? That way, at least we can try to get around some of that. And that's okay. But I want to make it so that, you know, it's at least a little bit more fair. Um, so we'll do it that way. And again, I understand. I understand the frustration, but I'm going to make it up to you. Um, so we're going to do it probably just the same exact time uh, that we did it today. Uh, so that would still be uh, 7 a.m. my time, 7 a.m. Mountain Standard Time. Um, and... Yeah, I think that, well, why so early? Well, it's early because there's a lot of people in the UK who, um, you know, actually, that's a good question. Um, why, I think you should just do it through Twitter. A lot of people probably don't know about having a raffle. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna check. He might, you know what? He might not have retweeted. <laughs> oh, good, good point. All right. So I'm going to whisper, I'm going to whisper to this guy and, um, and we'll find out. So here we go. If I find out that he can't show me his Twitter account, um, that actually retweeted, then we will just do it that way. You know what I mean? Well, I can find out when somebody retweeted, you know, so it's, uh, it's not that, not that difficult. So if if he didn't we will have an extra key to give out so we'll worry about it that way so again thank you so much thank you for everybody who actually uh subscribed to the channel that means a lot to me um you can see that um this is still a small stream 
this is still a developing artifact stream. So it's nice to have guys come by, even if it's for, if it's for the keys, that's okay. Um, I do appreciate that you guys like being able to spend time and the people who do like the content that were you know, involved in the chat and being able to make sure that, you know, you were here for Paulo's interview in the beginning. Paulo's interview, all of that, all this whole stream will actually get up to, uploaded to YouTube uh, here shortly. And then I will also, uh, I'm gonna whisper you what did it cost as soon as the stream's over, um, I will go ahead and, um, and do that for you. So again, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And uh, we will talk to you soon.